Okay, I think it's uh, time to uh, get started. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about analyzing um, blockchain and Bitcoin transaction data as a graph. Um, let me introduce myself quickly. My name is Zhe Wu. I am an architect in Oracle database organization. Um, there's a team called Oracle Spatial and Graph. I'm an architect slash engineer. Okay, so first of all, the uh, almighty uh, safe harbor statement. This uh, kind of protects me from saying anything silly or offending or whatever, okay? Now, um, a quick outline. I will give you an overview of uh, blockchain technology and uh, what Bitcoins are, okay? I will drill a little bit into the details of uh, Bitcoin transactions. One of the focus area of this talk is a graph, you know, how graph can be applied um, to model blockchain Bitcoin transactions and analyze them. Um, so I will quickly give you an overview of uh, Oracle Spatial and Graph property graph. It's a feature in Oracle Spatial and Graph. Feel free to um, raise your hand and ask questions. First of all, a few uh, basic terminology. Um, blockchain. This is uh, actually the easiest concept. Uh, it's a chain of uh, blocks. Each block has a few transactions and some hash code we'll get into in a few slides. But essentially, it's a chain of blocks. Um, Bitcoin is a, um, an application of blockchain technology. So it's one of the applications. Um, I guess many of you are familiar with the, you know, the hype, the price up, ups and downs recently, right? Um, ICO, initial coin offering, is similar to IPO in the stock market. You will see uh, Ethereum, ETH, Litecoin, and so many other you know, different digital currencies. In US dollars, right, uh, we have dollars, you know, $20 bill, $100 bill, we also have one cent, okay? Um, in Bitcoin, the smallest unit is not a Bitcoin, it's a so-called Satoshi. Um, it's, you know, the number is right there, you know, it's really tiny uh, uh, decimal. Nouns, number used ones, okay? So this is actually a critical concept. Um, so basically it's a number we need to find, okay, and attach to a block, so that when we run certain hash on the block, the hashed result, we have a particular pattern, okay? So this is called number used ones. And uh, SHA-256 is a hash algorithm, so basically it can take an input and produce a 256 bits hash. It's also called a signature. Um, there's a few unique uh, things about this hash. Given an input, it's trivial to compute the hash. Everybody can do that. Even with, on a smartphone, you can easily do this kind of hashing. However, given a hashed result, it's extremely hard to find an input that can produce that exact output, okay? Oh, whoops. Um, there are two important names um, for blockchain bitcoins. The first one is Wei Dai, um, who is believed to be one of the first um, researchers, right, who came up with um, this cryptocurrency concept. Okay. There's another interesting name, Satoshi Nakamoto, um, who is believed to be the one who developed, you know, a working prototype of, block, uh, of bitcoins. Okay. But we don't truly know who that person is. There are a few guesses, but uh, none of them has been confirmed. If you know, happen to know the exact identity, you know, drop me an email, okay? Um, mining. So many of you probably have heard about, you know, the mining uh, um, blockchain bitcoins. So there are a few uh, pictures on the top. 
So traditionally, when we talk about mining, right, we think about you know uh, digging hard, working hard, right? Dig a hole, try to find the gold. Once you find something, you know the person will be really, really happy. Okay. But for the Bitcoin, mining is a different game. Okay. See, so at the bottom, there's a um, screenshot of all those you know customized hardware, okay, that are used to to mine bitcoins. So what exactly is mining here? Mining is nothing but solve that you know, puzzle, okay, the puzzle in blue found. Basically, given a piece of data, right, data contains a set of transactions. The so mining is to find that lungs, number used ones, so that when you can calculate your data with this number used ones, you do this SHA-256 twice, you get a hash you know, output, right? And the output is a number which is smaller than a predefined difficulty. Are you guys with me? Okay, so you run a hash function, generates a numeric value, and the goal is that you, know, you need to tweak your data a little bit, right? Append a little bit of something so that the output is smaller than a predefined value. And the one of the cool thing about this, well, we all know computers you know, are getting more and powerful, more powerful and powerful every single day. Right? So a year from today, you know, this kind of difficult question may not be that difficult anymore. Right? But in order to keep the time to find, to solve this puzzle to about uh, 10 minutes, right, this difficulty can be adjusted. Okay, so every once in a while, um, the system we are determining, okay, so now we need to increase the difficulty a little bit more. So the purpose of mining, there are two purposes at least. The primary one is to, given a chain of blocks, an existing chain of blocks, mining will try to find the next block, okay, so that we can append to the current chain. A side effect is if you, uh, you know, happen to be the one um, who mined a block, who solved that puzzle in blue found, right? You will get rewarded. Okay, um, at this, at this, uh, at this time, the reward is about 12.5 bitcoins, and each bitcoin is worth about 10,000 US dollars. Okay. I want to remind you, mining is really, really expensive computationally. But it's trivial to validate the results. Let's say once you, know, uh, you figure out you know, the lungs, right? it will be trivial for anybody to validate, okay, that's indeed a correct work. Right? So the combination of a block with the correct lungs right, is what we call the proof of work. Okay? It proves that sort of you, know, you have done the hard work, right? you did the mining, you found the lungs. Um, if you have a few GPUs or a you know, set of computers, you may, you may think, hey, maybe I can give it a try. But um, I wouldn't really uh, recommend that because look at the picture, right? It's all those you know, shelves of dedicated hardware. And uh, for people who are serious in uh, mining, they usually find a place maybe with wind, electricity, right? Um, electricity is cheap, right? You find a mountain, there's a lot of wind, so you can put a farm there you know, just to, to mine the bitcoins. Now, if you still have a little bit of doubt about mining, uh, let me uh, show you uh, with a simple piece of code. So this piece of code is uh, written in SQL, um, actually in PL SQL, but it doesn't matter even if you are not a SQL developer. Um, the input is this uh, string, right? Oracle code LA 2018. You can put all kinds of transaction data inside. This is just for illustration. And then, well, the goal is to find out nouns, right? Number used ones. There's no good way other than brutal force. We try one, next one, increase it further, so on and so forth. We have to do it you know, in a loop kind of thing. So here I have a loop starting from zero to 90,000, I just pick a random value there. And then we concatenate 
the original data with these nouns. Okay. And the next one is the critical piece. Basically, we run this SHA-256 uh, hash twice. Okay. So this part is quick, and then uh, this part is to say, hey, does this output start with three zeros? Okay. Because if a number starts with many zeros on the left, the number is pretty small. Right? Make sense? Okay. And then if it so happens, uh, we find a nonce such that the hash output starts with three zeros, we stop. Okay. So if we run this program, um, in about in a few milliseconds, we will find a nonce, which is a f uh, 451, which produce this uh, uh, hash results. Right? And as you can see, there are three leading zeros. Okay. So just to give you um, an idea how it runs in practice. Can you see it? Uh, oh, wait. Yes, this is not even show. Um, one sec. OK. Can you see it uh, from the back? OK. So basically, this is the program right? Um, I just described. Let's say we modify the data a little bit, say z. Uh, send John 0 0.2 bitcoins, right? So we modified the data slightly, adding you know some text, right? Um, and then we run this uh, piece of code in Oracle SQL in Oracle database. Okay, so you find the different nouns. Of course, I am solving a very uh, easy puzzle because. Um, the criteria I set for myself is that the value starts with three zeros. But if you just imagine if the value starts with 20 or 50 zeros, it's a magnitude of all uh, uh, harder right, than this uh, trivial problem. Okay? Hopefully this uh, gives you a good idea. Um, let's switch back to, uh, to the presentation. So when I talk about um, this is a chain of block, right? Um, I describe it as a you know just a blocks, right? The chain together. Um, this gives you a, a bit of a concrete idea. So each block has a um, hash of its own, has a particular nonce, okay? Has a data portion you can stick in many uh, transactions. It kind of chains to the previous block by including the hash of the previous block. Why do we do this? Okay, um, because one of the nice thing of blockchain is the whole database, right, uh, is immutable. Okay, immutable in the sense that if you touch, if you tamper the data even one bit, right, we all know the hash value is going to change. If the hash value of the current block changes, the next block will change. Okay, so then everything is messed up. So it's really easy to identify a, if somebody is tampering um, your data. So that's the sense, you know, the, uh, the uh, blockchain is immutable. Okay? You can only append. And once the block is appended, you cannot really uh, undo it. Um, there are a few motivations, right, uh, why we are interested in uh, Bitcoin and blockchains, right? It's really fun, okay? And there are a lot of uses of uh, Bitcoins. And most importantly, all Bitcoin transaction data are in, uh, in public domain. If you ever deal with uh, banks, right, if you do a POC with the banks, um, chances are they're going to give you some fake data to, or synthetic data to work with, right, for security reasons. But all Bitcoin transactions, right, if you start a Bitcoin daemon on your computer, and gradually it will pull in all transactions, every single transaction from 2009. Um, I did that. It took about 100 gigabytes in disk space. So it's a really valuable data set if you are interested in analyzing real world transaction data. So some happy story about Bitcoin. This young guy um, bought $27 worth of Bitcoin, for, you know, forgot about them, and then you know, after a few years, uh, he bought an apartment with it. 
And you probably have heard the, uh, the crazy pizza thing, right? Um, this is considered the first official Bitcoin transaction, right? Um, someone bought two pizzas, you know, um, using 10,000 Bitcoins. So that's uh, probably the most expensive uh, pizzas, right? Um, and, uh, but the, uh, there's a happy ending. So after that, you know, May 22nd um, is now considered the uh, Bitcoin Pizza Day. Okay? It's not a holiday, um, unfortunately. Okay? There are a lot of uses of Bitcoins. The first one is quite obvious. Right? You know, the price is, has gone up quite a bit. So um, Bitcoins can be used as an investment. So I gave a talk uh, July uh, 2017. Back then, the price has gone up a lot, right, to 2,700, um, and then all the way close to 20,000 US dollars per Bitcoin, as you can see uh, on the uh, chart on the right-hand side. And lately, it has come down. So there's a lot of fluctuations. So it's not really for faint-hearted and um, um, some researchers are worried about, you know, this whole thing may fall apart, right? If quantum computing a, um, can provide an effective way to, to do the hashing, right? To solve the puzzle. So there's a lot of uh, financial purposes, right? Um, beyond investment. You can use Bitcoin to buy stuff. I think Expedia or some other service uh, websites, they do accept uh, Bitcoins. And uh, you can use it, Bitcoin, to pay ransomware. Um, WannaCry is one of the ransomware, right? Um, they demand you pay them uh, using Bitcoins. So um, I was in uh, Taiwan uh, airport, <coughs> international airport. I, I saw a sign. If you carry more than 10,000 US dollars, um, the equivalent amount in Taiwan uh, currency, right? You have to declare. I was saying, hey, that's not convenient, right? It's kind of, you know, it's a hassle. If you carry Bitcoins, well, there's no need to uh, declare that, I guess. Um, some people use it to keep their wealth private. Um, but the uh, the underlying blockchain technology, this chain of blocks, right, the distributed you know, ledger, this immutable database, right, uh, has much wider applications, okay, like ownership, like a smart contract, or whatnot. There's a dark side uh, of bitcoins. Um, I guess this is part of part of the reason some people are against it, right? You can use it to buy drugs. If you are you know, a smart hacker, you can write a uh, ransomware and demand people to pay you in Bitcoins. But th there's a tip here, okay? Remember WannaCry? Okay, so um, it's a, essentially a virus, right? a ransomware. Um, it's a wrapper on top of a, a hack developed by NSA. Um, but this wrapper wasn't designed properly. So even if you pay um, WannaCry's developer, right, um, it's extremely hard to decrypt your files. They say, you know, they hack your system, they encrypt your files, right? Supposedly, if you pay, they decrypt it. But the wrapper wasn't designed properly. So that's um, an article about this. Um, if you are a victim of a ransomware, right, would you rather be a victim of an organized uh, criminal group or a lone wolf, right? Anybody? Lone wolf versus organized criminal group. Well, um, in this case, right, um, if you are a grandma, say 70 year old, you don't really know, how, you know much about computers, you, you want to deal with organized criminal group because they can set up a call center right, to help you uh, to uh, decrypt your files once you pay the ransomware. Okay. Um, there's some other dark uses, like you know, if you want to bribe someone without trace, it's getting darker, so let's uh, stop here. Now, let's look at uh, some of the tech, uh, some technical side. What does a Bitcoin transaction look like? So, transaction has a hash, 
um, you probably have noticed that you know um, for Bitcoin blockchain there's a lot of hashes. So each transaction has a hash and has an output sum, right? It's the total amount of uh, Bitcoins transacted. Um, in our daily life, right, when we make a payment, usually we, it's from one person to another person, right? But Bitcoin transactions sometimes can have many, many input and can have also many, many output, okay? So this is sort of a, you know, a tabular form or tax representation a, of a Bitcoin a transaction. So now let's look at it visually. Um, so here, right, there are three transactions, TX1, TX3, TX8 on the left. There's one transaction in the middle, TX9. The green boxes represent Bitcoin address. Sort of like the account number, right? Let's say your friend wants to send you some money, you know, they, need to know, uh, they need to know the account number. Okay, the Bitcoin address can be roughly sort of as account number. Here, transaction X, right, has three output, okay? Can you see my mouse movement? No. Um, so there are three edges coming out of TX1, right? Three arrows coming out of it. The second arrow goes to address X and also is the input to the uh, transaction line, okay? If we pay attention to the uh, TX8, which is the dot on the bottom left, so there are two output of these transactions, right? Um, and the first output becomes the second input to transaction line, okay? And the output of transaction line goes to three different uh, Bitcoin addresses. Make sense? So in Bitcoin, in, in this world, right, every single Satoshi is accounted for. So now is probably a good time to talk about what is a graph. Um, actually, what you are looking at is a graph, right? Um, so there are, you know, uh, these dots, you know, rectangles, those uh, uh, essentially nodes, right, or vertices, okay? They represent entities. In this particular use case, they represent, you know, transactions on the left or the Bitcoin addresses, right, in the middle and on the right. The useful thing, the most useful thing is, is a link, right? The links among the, um, uh, among the vertices or nodes. So here there's transaction, there's a Bitcoin movement from one a transaction to another transaction or from one transaction to a Bitcoin address, okay? So essentially a graph is nothing but linked data, so you have data represented in a particular way that links, right, represents relationships. So before we can, before we really can apply graph, you know, visualization, graph analysis, graph query, um, let's talk quickly about uh, how we can model this, right, um, as a graph. So. Now we have a visual representation of the data. Um, intuitively, you know, this is the first try. We can say, hey, you know, we just use this as is, right? We have transactions, we model that as uh, vertices. We have address, we model that as addresses, as vertices as well. And all those Bitcoin movement, right, become edges in this graph. So we have two kinds of uh, edges, right? transaction to transaction, and also transaction to address. And then, as I explained, right, transactions input are actually output of other transactions. So in this case, we do can create links. Okay, for example, transaction one, the second output goes to address X, okay? And then we can then draw a edge, right, from that address, address X to transaction nine. So now we are bringing the addresses closer, okay? My goal is to create a graph with just address, right, to mimic, you know, what we are familiar in our daily life, right? I pay you some money, you move some money to my account, so it's, we have this account and the money movement, right? So here I want to get rid of the transactions, I just want to leave address, right, and also the uh, Bitcoin movement among those addresses. 
Of course, there are definitely more than one way to model it as a graph. So now, um, on this slide, right, uh, remember, you know, the um, Bitcoin flow from address X and Y to a transaction and then go to K and L and Z, right? So now we can forget all those transactions and just, you know, create edges directly among X to K, X to L, X to Z, and same thing for Y. Okay? Now there's a question, right? Um, because, you know, the, the Bitcoin from address X, right, doesn't go directly into K or L or Z, right? How do we, you know, calculate the contribution, right? So here I'm using a simple formula to sum it up and then, you know, depending on the uh, amount uh, that goes to different addresses, right? I use this formula um, to assign the contribution. So now X has a contribution to, uh, to K, to L, and so, so on and so forth. Um, now, uh, let's look at the, uh, um, an interesting pipeline. So basically, how we can analyze Bitcoin transaction as a graph, right? So this is, uh, you know, there are five steps. The first step is to parse uh, Bitcoin transaction data. And then there's a little bit of a cleansing, you know, data preparation. We need to turn the data into the shape we need, right? And then we generate a graph, um, load the graph into the graph database, and then visualize and analyze the graph. Um, and the last three steps are actually functions of a so-called graph database. Okay. So now looking at this pipeline, right? Um, which step do you think is the most time-consuming step? A anyone? Um, it's actually the parsing and data preparation. Uh, usually, that's the uh, uh, most time-consuming part. You have to understand your data. You have to get the data into a shape you need. Right? That usually takes a few uh, round trips. So now I want to take a detour and quickly um, talk about what a graph database is. Um, Dan Volamis, you know, who's a gentleman sitting there, he uh, gave a wonderful uh, talk about, you know, property graph 101 um, in the morning. Um, so this is the same architecture slide. So basically we have a um, persistent and scalable storage layer for graph data. Okay? You have a choice. You can stick your data into Oracle Relational Database, or if you prefer to use a big data platform, uh, we have uh, Apache attribute support and Oracle NoSQL database support. So you can store data there in a very scalable way. In the middle, there's a data access layer. Uh, it's a set of Java APIs which abstract all those, you know, minute details of different backends. It also provides integration with uh, Lucene and Solar Cloud, right? Um, on the top, there's uh, this very powerful parallel in-memory graph analytical engine, which can also run a uh, graph query. So graph query is like a sort of pattern matching. You define a pattern, a template, and then we try to find matches, right, uh, in the graph for you. Um, we have a, a tight integration with a, a visualization tool called Cytoscape. This is not the only visualization tools we support. Um, we support a set of uh, different programming interfaces, you know, Java, Groovy, Python. We have REST interface, and uh, oh, by the way, we also have a nice integration with Apache Spark. Okay, basically, you can um, define your data frames in Apache Spark and then analyze them as a graph. We also support. Um, a different sort of uh, um, workflow, right? You, you can pull out graph data from the back end, create a data frames in Spark, and run machine learning uh, jobs using Apache Spark. So I want to spend um, a little bit of time on PGX itself. Um, it's an in-memory engine, right? Um, 
In PGX, we use very compact data structures to represent a graph. Um, so it's very efficient. You can run a lot of analytical functions in parallel. Okay. You can also run the so-called property graph query language in parallel. So here I'm showing a, a few algorithms, right? They're about you know, 40, 50 um, well-tuned analytical functions out of the box, like page rank, shortest path, uh, clustering, so on and so forth. Okay? So you don't resist, right? You don't really need to reinvent, right? You don't have to redevelop, right? You can just use them out of the box. Um, we have integration with the solar and the Lucene. Why do we do that, right? Because it, when you are dealing with a large property graph with a lot of properties, uh, sometimes you don't know where to start. Okay, with a text query engine, uh, you are able to pinpoint vertices and edges of interest, and then you can start your work from there. Okay. Visualization, one of the strengths of a uh, uh, doing a graph, right, is that, you know, um, you represent your data as a graph. And then you can lay, lay them out on a screen and then you know, take a look at it yourself, right? So here I have a very nice picture uh, near the bottom. Um, it's actually a graph about SQL and tables, uh, different SQL statements and different tables, right? They form really interesting clusters. Because some SQL statements may involve, say, table one, table two, but a different SQL statement may, may involve table two and table three. Right? So if you do clustering, you get a really interesting uh, layout. So Cytoscape, um, this uh, is a very powerful open source visualization. Um, we developed a, a plugin. So from Cytoscape, you can connect to a Oracle database, Oracle SQL database, uh, or Apache Edge base. Okay. So from this uh, UI tool, one can run, you know, clustering, find the shortest path uh, between, you know, two Bitcoin addresses, right? Um, or find the most um, critical uh, Bitcoin address in the whole uh, Bitcoin transaction graph. We also have um, UI, this is uh, from partners. Okay, one of them is Tom Sawyer. Um, they have really high-end visualization, uh, web-based. The company is uh, based uh, close to uh, UC Berkeley. Um, and uh, we also have integration with Incurious, uh, Cambridge Intelligence. One can also you know, design your own sort of you know, JavaScript-based uh, uh, visualization. For example, you can use VisJS or Sigma.js. PGQL um, is a property graph query language. Uh, if you are familiar with SQL, you will appreciate this syntax quite a bit because you will see select, you will see while clause, right? And uh, in the select, you can define the uh, query pattern. Say, I want to figure out, you know, the hobbies of my friends. Uh, you can easily declare that as a sort of query pattern. Okay, we also have notebook front end, uh, Jupyter Notebook and Zeppelin. Anybody using Jupyter or Zeppelin here? Okay, good. Um, so Jupyter uh, is Python based, right? Um, we provide Python wrappers to the Java APIs. There are a lot of existing uh, Jupyter uh, notebook users. Zeppelin sort of has a slightly modern look and feel. Okay, gradually we see, you know, there's more pickup of uh, Zeppelin. And we offer this uh, Zeppelin integration um, in addition to uh, Jupyter notebook. Um, we support, you know, all those, you know, popular APIs, REST interface, Java, Groovy, Python. If you have tried Neo4j or Titan, right? Chances are you use the Tinkerpop APIs. So we support Tinkerpop APIs. Uh, so it will help you, you know, if you want to ever try Oracle solution, it's pretty easy to, to use the same APIs, more or less the same APIs to, to run your apps, right? Uh, on Oracle's uh, property graph database. So that's sort of, you know, a, a detour um, about a Oracle's property graph database. 
Now let's go back to the um, to our pipeline to, to this workflow. The first step is to um, to pass the uh, the block data, uh, blockchain data. Right here, I'm using one of the uh, open source a blockchain a Bitcoin um, uh, SDK, Bit Bitcoin J. So with that, you know. Um, I can just fill in uh, the blocks in and then can uh, easily tease out all those transactions, input, output. Okay. So now that's the, uh, the raw data, right? Now we have the raw data. What's the next step? Now I need to clean it up, right? Remember when I talk about the uh, uh, different choices of graph modeling, right? One of them is to to compute the contribution of you know uh, bitcoins from address X to address K, right? Um, here I am using Oracle database because I just you know take the raw data out, stick it into a table, and then use a few SQL joins. Uh, you can also use uh, Spark or Java or whatever right programming um, uh, platform of your choice. So here I'm using Oracle database. Um, this uh, shows a, uh, an example, right? Um, the font is, uh, font is a little bit small, but it's one of the key tables uh, we used, right? So there are a few columns, right? Address, right? From address, there's a Bitcoin address, two Bitcoin address, and the con contribution, okay? So roughly each row represents a sort of, you know, a flow of Bitcoins from one address to another address. Now I have you know, a table right, um, full of a transactions, right, full of Bitcoin uh, records. Next step is to use the, um, the existing, one of the existing utility that can convert from a relational data source to a graph. Okay. The API is to convert RDBMS table to OPV. OPV is the, the so-called flat files. It's one of the graph serialization format that we defined. Okay. Well, just to give you a rough idea, so this flat file is really simple. It's line by line, record by record. Okay. So on the right-hand side, you will see you know, a sequence of uh, uh, records, right? Um, each one in this case, right, represent one particular Bitcoin address, right? We assign a unique vertex ID and also use the Bitcoin address as the property of that vertex. So here we are talking about property graph. So we have vertices and edges. In addition, you can associate properties. Properties are nothing but key value pairs, right? So here a property is Bitcoin address, which is a key, and the actual hex is the value. So now we have uh, the, all the vertices in this graph. We can run the uh, more or less the same API, but produced edges, okay? So on the right-hand side, you will see a snippet of the edges. So edges are similar to vertices, but in addition, you know, we have the source vertex ID, destination vertex ID, right? Okay? So we are done with the step three. We have a graph now. Now we pass the source data, we get the raw data from blockchain, we produce a graph data, then we load it up into Oracle database. <clears throat> you can also um, load the data into uh, Apache Edgebase or Oracle NoSQL database. It's uh, really simple. Uh, here I'm showing the actual API to do that, to finish the data loading. You load data with SQL loader, we also support JDBC and external table. You give the uh, <clears throat> username, password, and the SQL loader uh, pass to the SQL loader, and that's it. We load it up into Oracle database in parallel. So this is uh, really efficient. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> so. Um, now we are at the most uh, exciting step, okay? Finally, we have a graph. We can run 
visualization, we can run query and uh, graph analytics. So here you see two sort of uh, snapshot of uh, a graph. Note that I only converted a, a small portion of the data um, into a graph. So in this graph, um, we have about 364k vertices and 750k edges. Um, on the right, on the left hand side, you will see this, uh, you know, um, Bitcoin address, right, represented as a vertex, right, and also this money flow represented as edges. Okay, so here I'm running page rank. If you are familiar with page rank, you know the page rank can be used to sort of tease out important web pages or entities um, in a network, right? Um, so we run page rank and then kind of you know assign different bubble size, right? Based on the uh, importance of different Bitcoin addresses, so you will see you know there are some Bitcoin addresses that that have bigger bubble size. That means that it carries a higher page rank value. On the right hand side, you will see the flow, right? Uh, because the Bitcoin flows from one address to another, it doesn't stop there. It keeps flowing, right? As people are doing all those uh, transactions. But somehow, in this part of the data, you will see there's a lot of Bitcoins floating, uh, flowing from right hand side and then goes to a, a sink. Right? So, so once you visualize it, right, once you place it on the screen, you will see this uh, interesting pattern. Um, you will also see this sort of forks, right? There's a fork, you know, as another fork keeps on forking. So all of this, right, um, a, very easy to observe and identify. Okay, once you model the data as a graph and then you, you visualize that. Okay, so now let's uh, look at a few Bitcoin, uh, um, um, look at, you know, how one can query the Bitcoin transaction data. Remember, you know, I got the raw data and stick it into Oracle database, right, to do some cleansing and, uh, you know, transformation. The, so part of the source data is in relational form. So with a single statement, right, I can find top transactions, right, using SQL. So here I'm running a parallel SQL, right, just do an order by, this is a very trivial SQL query. And then, you know, have a row number less than five, essentially to filter just to show the first top five transactions. So this is, uh, the data is from one of the early um, Bitcoin data block. So back then, the, uh, the amount of Bitcoins are sort of huge, right, in today's standard. So if you look at it, right, this particular transaction, right, has a, an amount of uh, 400,000 Bitcoins. Okay, that's, uh, in today's value, it's uh, enormous. Okay, but back then, it wasn't that much. Um, with the uh, PGX in memory analytics, you can run page rank, and here I'm showing a page rank output, right? And then to use the uh, Java APIs, right, opg.getVertex, right, to read out details about Bitcoin address. So here, the output gives you the three most important Bitcoin addresses in this, in this data set. And you can actually take this hash, Bitcoin address, do some Google or go to Bitcoin info, right? You can actually dig out a lot more information about this particular address. I mentioned PGQL. The font is really small here, but you know, there's a, a SQL-like uh, query, right? Um, select N, count M, there's a while clause, right? There's a group by, order by, okay? So we, we try to reuse as much SQL syntax as we can. Um, so this one can find, this particular PGQL query can find Bitcoin addresses with a lot of sends. It's a Bitcoin address, right? It sends out a lot, a lot of transactions, okay? So we run this. This query can be executed in parallel by PGX engine against this graph. And you will see there's a lot of matches. Um, if we take a look at the first one, um, you know, shows the, this particular Bitcoin address uh, at the bottom uh, this address 
um, you can do a little bit of research by yourself, right? Just cut and paste, uh, and then uh, go to a website, and you see there's a lot of transactions, a lot of bitcoins coming in and out of that address. So um, I bet you have noticed one thing. Um, in this data set, right, you don't see people's names. Right? You don't really see any readable, um, easy to read text. You see a lot of hacks, hex code, right? hashes. So in a way, Bitcoin transactions are really anonymous. Okay, but are they really, really totally anonymous? Well, you have to be careful. Like uh, in this particular one, right? Um, a newbie is you know, having an issue with his or her transaction. So this person uh, essentially say, hey, please, someone help with this transaction, right? Um, the transaction ID is uh, uh, listed there and also with the, uh, the user ID. Okay, boom, there you go. So we kind of reveal some information about this particular user. Okay, because from the transaction, we can find quite some input and output, right? And then from that point, we can associate those addresses, right, to this particular user. Um, there are some observations. For example, right, there are some very active addresses, right? Like the, the one on the right hand side, if we zoom in, like there's a lot of you know, uh, Bitcoins flowing into that address. You will also notice the clusters right, on, the, on the right hand side. I also noticed this uh, you know, very interesting pattern. Um, it's sort of you know, from one address to another address, and then there's a little bit uh, a small Bitcoin flow of a 0 0.02 Bitcoin um, on the bottom, and the sort of repeats you know, another 0 0.02 Bitcoin to, um, to a Bitcoin address. It keeps on repeating. It feels like somebody is uh, doing testing uh, of Bitcoin transactions. Okay. Um, I have two minutes left. Um, this talk you know, covered you know, um, some basics about Bitcoin, blockchain. Blockchain is a very useful technology. Gives you sort of you know, distributed ledger, right? It's an immutable database. You can trust it because once data um, gets into the chain, you cannot really touch it. You cannot modify, right? Um, we also covered the uh, uh, property graph database, Oracle Spatial and Graph Property Graph Database. The techniques covered in this talk, right? Um, the graph modeling, the graph query, the visualization, the analytics, page ranking, all those kind of stuff, right? They can be easily ap uh, applied to other domains. So who are the users uh, um, that are using um, graph technologies? Usually the customers in banking, they need to model um, users, accounts, right? And the money flow, logistics uh, network, asset network, uh, social graph, social network, of course, right? And security. Yeah, and the public sector, they, um, they're tracking terrorists, right? If one guy is a, who is a suspect, right, hops on an airplane, then it's important to see, you know, uh, whether the, uh, there are uh, his friends, um, go to the same destination or a hop on the same airplane, right? So those kind of stuff can be modeled as a graph. So there's a lot of future work about, you know, um, to further analyze um, the uh, Bitcoin transaction data um, using graph. Like how do we identify true value of transaction, right? Because the value fluctuates so much, right? Unlike US dollars, you sort of can count on it. This Bitcoin one day is up 30%, the other day is, you know, goes down 50%. You know, how do you keep track of the true value, right? Um, there's a lot of resources if we want to know more about uh, Oracle's property graph database, right? There's a lot of blogs. Uh, that's a very interesting, very useful sort of getting started, right? 
with a property graph on Oracle database. It's by a Vlamis software, um, a, a gentleman uh, from that company called Arthur Dayton. He did a beautiful job. Um, we're going to have a analytics and data summit um, in March in Redwood Shores. So if you want to know more graphs, so over there we, we're going to have 10 uh, graph sessions in addition to a lot of machine learning sessions. And before the, right before the event on the Monday of March 19, we're going to have a graph developer day. Um, it's a four day workshop. If you are interested, by all means, send us a uh, email. Um, it's free registration. So if, we, if you want to understand uh, graph modeling, how to apply graph to different use cases, um, feel free to attend this event. Okay, so with that, I'm going to open up for questions. Make, yes? So the question is, during the data processing, uh, why did I choose Oracle database? There's no particular reason. Um, it's, you know, I'm familiar with both Java you know, and the Oracle database. I can pick Java, uh, Hadoop, or Spark, or Oracle database. Um, so it's just uh, any tool. So Oracle database, in this case, serves as a tool. Okay. So you can pick whatever tool you like to do the data preparation and data cleansing. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Okay.